Hello everybody and welcome to Handmade Hero Show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are going to pretty much do some cleanup today and testing. Uh, where we left off last weekend was we got everything working that we were trying to do with respect to rewriting files and changing the alignment points in them and so on. But I, we, you know, we haven't really put it through its paces and there's probably some bugs lurking in there. It's kind of subtle what we decided to do. Um, I kind of tried uh, something a little bit different from what I would normally have done in that we actually try to preserve the file the way that the user wrote it, which is kind of a step beyond what you might ordinarily do. Uh, and with that comes some complications, and as a result, I'm not really 100% sure of what we did, right? It's um, anytime you kind of do something new like that, you're always experimenting, uh, and you have to kind of give it a little while to sink in and you'll probably learn some things about how the code was structured that later on you'll be like, okay, probably this isn't the best way to do it. You know, now that I've done it one time, I would change some things about it a second time and so on. So it's definitely the kind of thing where I'm like, yeah, uh, we may, you know, we may revisit some of that or, you know, maybe we'll leave it as it is if it works well enough. And, but I would still say something like, if you were going to do this now, knowing what we know, maybe you do it a little bit differently. Uh, but anyway, I would like to start off by just addressing some bugs that were reported in the GitHub because during the week, sometimes other folks who play around with the code base uh, will report bugs into the GitHub uh, and we can go ahead and fix those bugs just because, hey, they've already been found by somebody. Uh, we might as well do that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, oh, this was a clean reboot here. They actually replaced the breakers in the apartment the other day. And so all, all the machines powered down. Uh, so they had to be rebooted. Anyway, uh, if we go ahead and, and uh, just jump into the code here, I'm going to open up 4Coder uh, and uh, try to remember what the old hotkeys were for everything. Um, so if we go to Handmade Hero here and I build the project, um, let's just take a look at the ones that uh, that Kim had uh, explained before. He said that in the edit, editable Boolean, editable size, we just really quickly ported those over to being able to use regular strings. Uh, and it looks like we forgot uh, a couple of the capital S's. So if we just jump to editable Boolean, uh, you could kind of come down here and see these things here where we do the format string. When we pass, we, we made our own printf so it can take our own types. And if you look here, this label text is coming in as a string. And so we want that to be a capital S so that the format string knows properly how to parse it. Uh, the other one is apparently editable size, had the same problem. Uh, and so if we jump to that function, you can see, just looking through here, uh, it's the same exact problem, right? So there's the label text and we just need that capital S. Uh, so again, these things were written before we were using strings. So we're just kind of like moving them over to the new way of doing things, which because it's C isn't perfect. Um, you know, the the way that I even, even in C, the way I do these now is I just bite the bullet and have some more kind of uh, expensive ways of doing things, but that don't have this problem. Uh, saner languages don't require you to have a format specifier. Whatever the type is that you pass, that's the type of the input, right? So it's it shouldn't really be possible to make a mistake like this, but C++ is, ver args are horrible, and, you know, as usual, the C++ committee didn't see the need to improve them over 30 years, so that's where you're at. Uh, so anyway, if we take a look at uh, the last one you mentioned, error apparently is not calling the correct thing. Uh, he's probably talking about, yeah, okay, so it actually highlighted, I don't know why I jumped there. Uh, so this one here, he's saying it needs to pass uh, arglist. I'm not sure, uh, did he make that change, I guess? Because I'm saying like this looks like it passed it correctly. So I'm assuming that the one in ours doesn't look like this because the buggy was reporting that was that we weren't passing that. Uh, and so I'm assuming that, uh, oh, you know what? No, he's just he's just saying we weren't calling out arglist. Uh, and that's 100% that's correct. So we should actually call that because uh, remember, we had to split those functions up. Okay. 
Um, so let me go ahead and jump there and we'll take a look. Let's see here, that's not the one we're talking about, uh, but this one is. Uh, and so we have an out arg list, I believe, don't we? Yes. Uh, so we have one that we can call explicitly and you can see it here. Uh, and so if I want to, I can call this one explicitly. I don't know that we did a pound define for it, but it looks like we didn't. Uh, and so you kind of need to pass the file name and line number to out if arg list in order to make it work. Uh, and so that would have to happen here as well. Now there's a number of ways, like I said before, that we can do this. And I'm not sure which one we really wanna do sometimes. It can be a little confusing. Uh, if you look at what we're doing here, we're uh, putting the args, uh, the error, we're putting that actually into the format string as a prepend. Uh, and that's something that we wanna do anyway because we wanna put the value of the token in there. Uh, and so that kind of informs our decision as to what's passed to out if arg list. Out if arg list takes a file name and a line number so that it can tell you who is reporting it. Uh, and so in this case, I think we just wanna do this, right? We just wanna say, look, we're gonna use this file name and line number uh, to report the error here. Uh, because we're just trying to talk about ourselves having reported it. We don't really want to pass the error along, uh, the location along from on token. That again is just a judgment call. It's a little weird the way we chose to do this. And so, you know, we support this idea of every entry in the buffer being able to say who uh, put it in there. But when it comes to error messages, it's a little confusing. Because again, you don't know whether you're talking about uh, the file name and line number of the person reporting the error or the file name and line number that generated the error. And you could pass either one and there's no right answer. It's just what did you want to do uh, and what did you want to have available to the code when it's looking at those things. Anyone who's iterating over the chunks gets whatever one we decide to pass here. Since nobody's really using that information at this point, I mean, another argument would be just get rid of it. It's probably um, not, it's not really something that we should even have. Uh, just insert it in the stream if you want it. So again, I, I don't really know what we want to do there. It's a little bit uh, hazy to me uh, which way this should go. Now, one way of thinking of it alternatively would be to say, well, what if, you know, we were trying to print one of these out and you wanted to like click on it and go to where the error was. That seems to suggest a different approach, right? Uh, and so you could imagine us saying, you know, on token file name and on token line number, maybe those are things that we should be passing, uh, you know, directly here, right? Like maybe we should be passing those so you can click and jump uh, to that line, something like that. Uh, and that does have some, uh, some merit to it. So another thing I might ask is, do we really, you know, when, when we're recording these here, we're just recording um, a file name pointer. And again, that's less good because it means we can't extract regions uh, out of the strings like we were doing with everything else. And so it kind of, uh, again, suggests that maybe these chunks want to be uh, using a string to remember what the file name was as well. Uh, again, kind of just a lot wrapped up in there. If I go back to how tokens were working, so if you take a look at the tokenizer here, we have the token type. You can see that the file name is itself a string, right? So we can't really pass this as a null terminated thing because we've kind of moved away from those null terminated things. So if we really wanted to do that in order to pass the file name and line number here of the error, uh, we would need to actually have out f take strings. Now, again, I don't really know, oops, uh, wrong file. I don't really know how I feel about that one way or the other. Um, in changing this to a string would make the stream truck slightly larger, not probably in a way we care about because these are not really heavyweight operations here. Uh, we don't really use these chunks in any kind of like hardcore way. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hard to say, right? Like, uh, I again, not really sure. So it's kind of one of those things where I just don't know what we would want to do here. Uh, and we could obviously have a wrapper that wraps this constant string uh, in a way that would allow us to uh, still pass it and all that sort of stuff. Since I'm so conflicted about all that, I'm just gonna say, look, we're just gonna pass this for now. And I'll put a to-do in here that says, look, in the future, if we want to, we can change stream tr chunk 
uh, to take strings, and then we could pass the on token file name line here, right? Uh, because we could, and uh, we're not going to do that now, but we could. Uh, and so I think that's all of the changes that uh, Kim requested. It looks like we've got, so there's an error there. Uh, cannot convert argument three to stream star. Now that's actually just because I'm calling the wrong function. I said I wanted to call that and just didn't type it in. Uh, so now I have, and that should be about it. All right. Um, so that's really all there is to what we're doing at the moment from this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close out this particular issue and just say I think it should be uh, resolved as of day 519. So I believe these should all be resolved as of day 519. And hopefully that, uh, you know, that'll take care of those to the extent that there was problems with them. We must just not have hit those uh, because we, you know, hadn't tested it or something, right? Uh, so in here, it looks like most of these other things are not super important. Uh, they're not relevant to what we're doing right now. Uh, and this test asset builder is probably never going to uh, get updated, so we'll probably end up closing that one out uh, one way or another, but we don't really need to do that right now. Uh, oops, that's not the one I want. This push size bug one, uh, I'm not sure I've really looked at it yet. It was reported as a problem with the size being small and size in it. Uh, and this is in handmade memory.h's push size underscore, so the core push routine. Uh, so let me just go look at what we're talking about here. Um, when size init comes in, it, let's see what we're doing here. So I don't under, the bug report's a little bit hazy. If the arena current block's size is smaller than the specified size init, this will be a buffer overflow. Uh, yeah, I mean, just for future reference, that is not really, like, you want to explain what you mean by this, right? Um, the fixes are fine, but it's more like, I'm not sure what you mean by this. I guess you just mean, in general, this situation causes a buffer overflow? Uh, so let's see why. So the statement is that uh, if the arena current block size, which is... Um, I can't say I'm quite seeing it yet. So if you look at what happens when you come through this piece of code, uh, if the arena has a current block, uh, then it's going to do some calculations. If it doesn't need to do that, so if there is no current block at all, uh, then it's going to do something else. So it will always enter here. Um, so I think maybe the right thing to say was if there is no current block, this would be a bug because that does look true to me, uh, right? Meaning this this get effective size for here, I think needs to happen in, in all cases. So I think probably, I guess I can't say why this wasn't getting called always. Um, because that's a little bit strange, right? Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems like we should just call that always. We don't really have to, though. Yeah, I'm not seeing it yet. So let's take both cases separately, one where current block is zero and one where current block is not zero. In the case where current block is zero, it will not call this. 
So the size will remain zero, right? Um, you will automatically enter this case because since this is true, you will come in here. That means that you will use the original size passed. You will not try to do any kind of alignment uh, for it, right? You won't do any of this sort of thing. Uh, you will then check to see if you need to do any kind of power of two alignment to it, which is sort of a separate thing for debugging only, and that would be fine. Uh, if it's too small for the arena's minimum blocks, well, you're not only checking it's too small, you're just saying, look, if, if there hasn't been any initialization of the minimum block size, then we are going to uh, create that minimum block size. What I would say about that, again, you can see this is fairly complicated, but what it's doing is just saying, look, if we aren't going to do an allocation of, because remember, if underflow or overchecking is on, we're not going to use blocks. We're just going to allocate everything piecemeal, right? Um, and so this stuff is, is designed to make sure that you don't aggregate things together, because otherwise they can overwrite out of their bounds and not crash. So... <clears throat> The entire point of underflow and overchecking is not to aggregate. So then you'd set the arena uh, minimum block size to uh, one megabyte if you were not doing any kind of allocation checking and no one had set one. You then allocate a block, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, you allocate however big this needs to be or whatever the minimum block size is, right? Uh, you then allocate it and you get back the block that you wanted. Uh, you then fall out of here and say, okay, uh, if the amount used plus the size is less than the current block size, which it has to be because we, or we just did that and used the zero. Uh, then we do the alignment offset, which is to say that we call up to uh, params.alignment, which is somewhere here it is here um, and you know what we in theory are supposed to have happen here and I you know I guess you could argue that this is maybe a bug but I don't know uh, I mean because we uh, because we're claiming that these things always have to be aligned to the Mac like that the memory blocks Ha are required to be aligned to the maximum thing you could ever align to, right? Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure if you want to call that a bug or not, but at least according to our comment, that was by design. Meaning we don't try to realign things if we know they're the first thing in a block that is the most aligned you're allowed to be. So you can't be more aligned than a 4K page. We just don't let you do that, right? Um, so I think that... <sighs> I mean, I think that... You know, maybe we could put another assertion in here that just says, look, you know, you, you know, make sure that the amount you return is not bigger than that. But I don't actually see the bug in that case. Let's try the other one. So let's say there is a current block. When we come through here, we're going to say get effective size for. And this is, I think, the case that was reported as being wrong. And, you know, I'll, I'll add the assertion here as well. Uh, meaning... You know, when we come through here, when it says note the base will automatically be uh, uh, aligned now, we would have to say that, well, yeah, and the power of two alignment, so we just have to assert that the power of two alignment is always going to be less than whatever the page alignment is, which we can also do, which is to say that uh, if we came through here and, um, you know, this alignment offset shouldn't put us further over. So we can just say, look, um, assert that the arena current block uh, used is less than or equal to the arena current block 
uh, size, right? Um, I believe it's, yeah. So we can just assert that, you know, once we've done this, uh, you know, something like this. Uh, and we can also say that, you know, we want to ensure that the page size uh, is is sort of the maximum there. So when, you know, the alignment comes in, uh, we could assert that you're not allowed to align to anything larger than the page size, right? Again, this has nothing to do with a bug that was reported, and it's also not a bug as far as I'm concerned, but it is the kind of thing that maybe you want to just put in there to be clear. Um, about what is and isn't uh, allowed in this case. Uh, so we could say, you know, look, whatever you're going to do uh, in terms of alignment, we're going to require that that alignment be reasonable uh, and not absurd, right? Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, you know, I could do something like that. I'm not sure. I'm just not sure what the best way to express that would be. Again, it's really unlikely that anyone would ever do that, but if for some reason they did, uh, that's a problem, right? And when we do that alignment, uh, where's the align pow to? Here it is. Um, yeah, you can see here too that this is required to be a power two because otherwise that code wouldn't work. So like you pretty much just need to ensure through all of this that it is going to obey those rules. Uh, it's just kind of implicit in the way that we designed it is, you know, it's it has to be uh, reasonable in that respect. So yeah, I guess what I'd say is we can add some assertions in here. Like we can say like assert uh, that params uh, alignment, uh, you know, is less than, let's say, t you know, uh, 1024, right? Like you can't, uh, align to anything bigger than, you know what, the heck with that. Uh, let's say you can't do anything other than 128 bytes, uh, or less. And we also want to assert that it is a power of two. Um, just to make sure that no one puts any uh, thing in there that's gonna be really weird. We would never do that, at least not on purpose. So we could catch a mistake, you know, if we made one. But somebody else who doesn't really know what they're doing who maybe tries to call this code, well, that could certainly backfire, right? Um, so I guess that's another possible reason to, to do so, uh, just to make it a little bit easier for other people to, to not do something bad. Uh, can't think of much else other than that. So if we do an ispow2, uh, that would just be something where we would, uh, I'm not sure where we'd want to put that exactly, but since we've got the aligns in here, um, we can just do one of these where we just say like ispow2. Uh, and then we can take, you know, input here. So uh, if, you know, we, we don't need to call it alignment. Uh, if we have a value that we want to be equal to power two, I think we should be able to check that relatively expediently. So, you know, if I take the value, um, I'm assuming I can do something like, you know, take the value and subtract one from it, right? And so if I subtract one from any power of two in binary, it will set all the things, all the bits before the what, you know, a, a simple way to say what a power of two is in binary is it's something that has only one bit set, right? Uh, and so if it has only one bit set, then if I subtract one from it, I'm going to get all of the bits to the right of that bit turned on, that bit and all the rest of the bits to the left turned off, right? And the, that's the only uh, 
time, I think that that could happen um, because any other value shouldn't produce that same pattern, right? Because uh, anything else would either have bits set to the left still or there would have been a hole somewhere and so you wouldn't actually get all of the bits turned on, right? There would be a stopper, uh, you know, or something. So what I would assume, I if I take the value minus one, right, and then I and it with the value. So I say, whatever I had originally, just and those two together, right? I, I guess I shouldn't say and those two together. Uh, I should say, if I take this and I and with the not of it, right? So I, I flip it around then I should get the same value back. Right? Because if all of the things below it are set to one, if I flip the, if I invert everything, so all those become zero and all the rest of the things to the right become one, if I and it, I should get just the top part and the top part should be the same as it was before because there shouldn't be any other bits set uh, that are higher than it. Right? Um, so I think that would work. The only question I have is, uh, I guess that doesn't necessarily fix the fact that, well, so that could still allow you to have more up top, actually, now that I think about it. So it's not quite right. Um, So I guess I need one additional check to make sure that you don't have anything else up on top, right? Like up on the high end of the value. Uh, and so when I do that, I would also need to say, yeah, uh, if I were to use the bottom part, um, Not sure what the quickest way to do that would be. That one's a little harder, although it sh shouldn't be that much harder, right? We may have to go to the blackboard for this. Um, and yes, this is something that I have done before, but uh, I'm I'm too old now. I forget everything. Uh, You used to have a good memory for things. Not so much anymore. To be fair, I was never much of a bit twiddling kind of guy. Uh, people who live and die by bit twiddling uh, and stuff are, are definitely more, oh no, my, my pen is plugged into the wrong machine somehow. That's no good. That's not gonna help. What? Um, hmm, well, hold on one second. Okay, maybe this will have improved our situation. Yes, okay. So let's, uh, let's try that again. It's a little weird though, like why am I getting, do we, why am I getting a weird, oh, because the opacity got turned down somehow. Not sure how. There we go. Um, I must have accidentally clicked that at some point. Uh, so let's take a look here uh, and just let me show you what I'm talking about. That is not how I normally do it. It's been too long. So uh, what I was saying before is fairly straightforward, right? Suppose you have a binary number uh, like so. Uh, and it doesn't matter how long it is, just any binary number. Uh, and I wanna go ahead and subtract uh, one from it, right? 
it's going to carry this way so that if this was a zero, right, it's going to keep trying to borrow till it gets to here. So if I subtract one from this number, I'm going to get a number that looks like this, right? Uh, which is that number minus one, right? In this case, you've got, remember, uh, your power is a two here, right? So you got this first one is one, then two, then four, then eight. So if you look at what these values are set to, you know, this one's set to eight uh, because there's only one bit set, and it's the eight bit. These three bottom bits are all set in the next number. One plus two plus four is seven, right? Which is exactly what you'd expect. It went from seven to one by subtracting one. And so what I was saying before is that, well, if you go ahead and and these two things together, uh, you can pretty quickly tell whether or not this part was a power of two, uh, because if you were to end um, uh, the, your result back with the thing that you had originally, you can either test for zeros here, um, or you can just test to see if you got uh, the same number again, right? Um, the problem that I'm having is how do I test to see, oops, how do I test to see what these are, right? Because you need something fundamentally that right here, you know, let's suppose that I want to differentiate. Um, here is a power of two. Here is something that is not a power of two, right? This one is eight, and this one is eight plus 16, right? I should write these in some other way. This, let's say. Uh, this one is eight. This one is eight plus 16, right? Which is 24, not a power of two, right? So this one has to be yes, and this one has to be no, if this routine is gonna be worth anything uh, in the checking, right? Uh, and so when we look at it, we need some way of determining that we don't have this particular circumstance. So again, uh, starting off with doing the subtraction, in both cases, we would get the same answer for our subtraction in the bottom bits, right? We're going to get one, one, zero, I'm sorry, one, one, one with a zero here. And the only difference between the two is going to be here, right? So the difference is going to be, in one of them, we're going to get a 1 up here, and in the other one, we're going to get a 0. So we end up with these two uh, different values. And we know that this one should yield a yes, and this one should yield a no. But we don't really have any way of knowing that that's true, right? We can trivially check to see whether this part was a power of two now, because I believe any other pattern that would have occurred down here, for example, let's say we had one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, or one, one, uh, sorry, one, zero, zero, one. If we did a subtract one on each of these, they would become one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, uh, and one, zero, 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 right? Uh, because subtracting a one from each of these uh, never propagates up to this value. So if we were then to do the, the operation I was suggesting before, which is to say that if you not these values, uh, you would be producing 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 1, 1, 1. Uh, and in each of these cases, if you were to and the value back uh, to the thing that you started with originally, uh, it would not propagate this number through, right? So you will definitely not match, right? Uh, you will definitely not match. So if you did equals equals value, right, which is what I was doing before, uh, you this will successfully tell you that, right? So we definitely have something that tells us if it's successful power of two uh, in terms of uh, those those low bits, right? But I'm just not sure whether or not it works all the way up to high bits. Now, I guess the answer is, are we sure that that same process doesn't still work? Uh, because now I think about it, if it works like this, it should work on any bit. So I may have just talked myself out of it for no reason. So let's see what happens. Uh, so let's say we were to do it here. Again, we got these two. Um, so if we now invert them, what do we get? Well, we get 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. 
Uh, in this case, we want this to be yes and this to be no. If we and this back with the original value, right, um, which was this, uh, we do get the, the same value back. If we and this, we don't. So you know what? I just, I'm just being too careful. I guess I, I did it correctly. I mean, uh, famous last words, right? But it looks like that does work for any bit pattern because it just can't propagate far enough down. You watch me be wrong about that. We didn't exactly attack that particular uh, verification with a, hell, a heck of a lot of uh, r rigor there, I suppose. But, you know, we'll see. Uh, so, yeah, again, you know, just a simple way to say, is this thing a power of two? Uh, that's all you really need to do, right? Um, I'm arguing you subtract one from the value to do the bit propagation. You and it. Uh, with the not of that, and you see whether you get the same value back. Uh, if you do, great. If you don't, then no. Um, that's the theory anyway. And uh, yeah, so we'll see if that holds up. Anyway, again, not even an essential part of the code. That's just there to provide that assertion. So now let's go through this routine and take a look uh, at the part that was actually reported as the bug. Again, all of that was not what was claimed. Um, so what was reported as a bug was saying, look, if current block does exist, but the size is less than it should be, right? So let's suppose that size in it comes in as, you know, 70 or something, uh, but current block only has a space for 60, because uh, that's what it says. If the current block size is smaller than the size in it, right? So this comes in as 60, this is set to 70. What's going to happen? Well, first, size will be adjusted for the amount that it might need for alignment, right? Um, and so when that happens, you can see it happening here. It's going to say whatever the alignment off offset needs to be, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and add that to the size because we're going to need that presumably for shifting or something like that, right? Uh, so then we say, okay, if there is not an arena current block, right, which is to say that if we, you know, uh, have some kind of a, uh, if we have some kind of situation where we haven't created anything before, uh, or we've got this. And so this might be the bug here where this looks like this is not in bracketed properly, right? Like I feel like that should say that. Um, because even, even if that isn't, uh, the bug as, as, uh, reported there, what you can see happening there is like, Hey, this comparison wants to be clearly between these two things. And I don't ever like e leaving something like that dangling anyway, because it's unclear what you meant the or to refer to there. And you're kind of just relying on C precedence rules to do the right thing. Uh, is that actually what was suggested as the bug? It's not, uh, but okay. Um, so they're suggesting that you change this to an and, which is something else entirely, uh, I don't understand why you would want to do that because you want to do this if you don't have a block or if it exceeds the size of the block. Uh, so I, I'm going to go ahead and say this is just wrong. Um, and I don't know C++ rules by heart, so I don't actually know whether you need this parentheses or not, but I want it there anyway uh, because... I just like that to be clear specifically so I don't have to remember C++'s precedence rules for operators. Um, why, you know, why would I want to have to remember that? So if you come through here, uh, you're gonna say, look, in this case, the case we're talking about, um, the size is going to overflow this, so you are gonna enter this case that means you're going to uh, reset the size to be size in it. And the reason is because now again, you know that it's aligned. So you don't have to have the alignment anymore because the alignment should just work. Um, the rest of this just works the exact same way it worked before. Um, don't see any problem. Uh, in here, it's, uh, so this was line 140, so make sure I have the right lines here. Uh, so that would have been, uh, 
I see. So they were actually suggesting, look, if you you want to test to see that this part of it and make sure you call get effective size for up here, but you don't. Um, so I just I fundamentally disagree with this bug report. I, I don't think you do that um, because this changes the alignment back to normal. So I think you it's totally fine, right? Um, if that makes sense. Uh, the only thing I'm not sure about here, I see why they want to do that now that I think about it though, because this is this check here, since this wouldn't be called, um, you would really want to do that, right? Because if they're, well, even that, but that doesn't make any sense because you're going to do this with it. So you really don't have to do that either. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think this bug report's just wrong, I guess is what I'd say. Uh, this one I do agree with because, uh, well, no, I don't agree with this one either. I just want the extra parentheses in there, uh, to be more clear. Uh, but this is also wrong. So I guess I would say this entire bug report is wrong. Would be my guess. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure that there wasn't a bug there. Now, what I do want to know is there might have been a bug if this, uh, that's totally separate uh, and unrelated to the particular bug report that was issued, which is to say that this uh, operator precedence here uh, might have been an issue. So let me check to see operator precedence uh, for C. Uh, just want to quick check the table. Uh, we can also look at the grammar. Those are easy ways to uh, to look. Uh, but what I want to see is who gets bound uh, um, higher. Of course, this this isn't what I want because it's not telling me which order these go in. Um, C operators are listed in order of precedence, highest to lowest. Their associativity indicates which operators equal preference in the expression. Uh, so let's see. Highest to lowest means that this is the most powerful. So let's take a look. So logical or goes below these. So I, that means we should. So so I don't know. Here's what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> um, the second issue is definitely not wrong. What's the second issue? This one here? Um, so, uh, the second issue is this one. Ginger Bill. Uh, and you're saying you want to be greater than or equal to, but it doesn't have to do that. What this is saying is if I were to take the current base position and I add the size to it, then I need to end that value needs to be either equal to the block size, because that means I have not overwritten it. I've ended at the location where it also itself believes it to, it to have ended, right? Um, or I need to be less than that. So the case where I need to allocate a new block is specifically the one where I would exceed the size, right? Um, Wanna go ahead and update this to tell me why you think that's wrong? Um, maybe the buffer overflow is because you had a bug in your code. Um, so let me try to, let me try to give you, uh, a, like a more constructive way we can step through it, how about I just set up one of these to be in exactly the situation that we're talking about, and then we could uh, um, uh, do, we could just see, right? Um, I, I don't know, does, 
Am I the only person who doesn't understand what the bug report is actually reporting? So what I changed was not a bug. It's just something I would like to do for clarity. So that wasn't a bug. So I, don't, I still don't see any bugs in this code. Uh, despite the bug report saying that there are two bugs in it, I actually see none. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out what they actually are. Uh, and this is wrong, at least from the perspective of what it's saying. There may be some other bug that's different or something. Um, uh, I don't know. So let me go ahead and construct the case just because, again, it's educational to see one way or the other. Uh, so we might as well do it. So if I just go into handmade.cpp, let's say, right? Uh, and in here, I construct uh, the exact case that we're talking about. So the bug claimed uh, that we were going to have um, a problem. Let me do it maybe at the end here, actually, now I think about it, just so I can make sure that the, um, that the memory subsystem has been started up uh, and has the platform allocator calls because we're going to be asking it to do an allocation. So I want to be able to construct a memory arena that would be in the situation that we're talking about here, right? So let's suppose that I take an arena um, and, uh, well, I don't even need to do that. I can just do this, right? Um, and let me make sure that I only do it once. So we'll also do a thing where we say, uh, look, let's put in a temporary here where we just say like um, persist. Do we still have persist? No, we don't. Local persist. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do is say local persist do once. Um, that's going to get initialized to zero. So then I'm going to say, look, if not do once, we'll come to this path. And now we can construct this situation, right? Uh, that is supposed to cause the bug according to the bug report. And then what I can do is see whether it actually causes a bug. And if it does, then we can debug it, right? So that you know, is kind of a good way to reproduce the, the bug. Um, so first what we'll do is we'll create an arena. And what we need to do is create the circumstance where, uh, as the bug said, it, the, the current block size needs to be smaller than what we're going to allocate. So what we can do um, is we can set this uh, arena, you know, we know that there's going to be a minimum block size for it. Uh, so let's test the, the most common case, which would be that, that no one set the minimum block size, right? So let's go ahead and allocate, uh, we'll try two different uh, things. But let's go ahead and allocate a block that will succeed, right? So we'll do a push size on the arena uh, where we say, here's the thing. Uh, our size is going to be the minimum block size for the arena, right? Um, minus something, right? So we'll just say it's going to be minus 30, right? A number that's not a nice even power of two, just to make sure that we're not you know, going to uh, bias in favor of a, of a good result. So just say, allocate everything except for 30 bytes of a block. OK, uh, so we're going to do that. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to leave the arena push params to be whatever they would normally be. And you know, if the bug report had said these params cause a problem, we, then we would want to put those params in there. But we didn't get any guidance along those lines. So we're just going to be like this. Right? Um, so there's our first uh, test allocation. Um, and here's our second. right? Uh, and I'm going to make sizes for these as well, uh, just so we can remember them, right? And so now what I'm going to do is just make something, I don't know, 50, right? So now we're going to have something that also needs to go, uh, you know, we, we need to put something in there. And we're expecting there to only be uh, 30 right, uh, 30 bytes long, and 50 bytes can't fit in the 30. So it should, if it's working properly, trigger new allocation. If it's broken, it should hit the bug case that's, you know, that's being contemplated here. Uh, so let's go ahead and, uh, and do that as well. So let's allocate size A here and size B here, right? And now we should get back both of those. What I might do is say, look, let's change these to U8s as well so that we can easily look at them in the debugger too. Because um, it's just a little bit of a handy thing. Doesn't really matter one way or the other, but we'll do that. 
Um, and then the other thing we can do is we could also like mem set these basically. Uh, so we could say like set, uh, I don't know if we've got a set eight call or anything here. Um, there we go, zero size. So now we'll also clear them to zero just to make sure, like double check. I, the, this code should do that, but just to make sure that somehow this code isn't doing something better than we would do when we get the memory back. Um, let's try to also ensure that we got something usable back that we could also use, right? Okay, and so now we should be able to step through this code and I'll, I'll set it to debug build so we can watch it. Uh, we could like actually step through each individual line um, and watch it happen. And then we should be able to see the bug happen uh, directly, right? Uh, at least in theory. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So why am I not seeing, what am I seeing? Uh, missing type specifier, what's the problem? Ah, yes, sorry. Uh, gotta just uh, finish that up. So we'll set do once a true at the bottom so that we won't do it an infinity of times accidentally. We don't really need to do that because we're not really keeping this, we're not leaving this in the game. Uh, so it's not really a big deal whether we do it or not, but I uh, just wanted to make sure of that. So now I'm gonna go ahead and do uh, MS dev and open it up here like so. Uh, and what we should be able to do is go to that part of the code. I mean, if there was definitely a bug in it, we just run it and it would crash there. Uh, but since we don't actually know, let's, and, and maybe there's a subtle bug that wouldn't immediately crash, we should at least look uh, and, and do our due diligence. I mean, the whole point of this is to look and see if there's a bug. We don't wanna just, you know, uh, say, oh, it's probably fine, right? Um, so let's uh, do the arena. Oh, you know what? Uh, there's a problem here, which is that the minimum block size won't get initialized yet. Uh, so we actually can't quite do that. Um, because we don't know what this will actually be. Uh, so that's a little bit harder. I guess I'll just say, look, I happen to know what it is. So I was trying to be clever there, but you know, oops. Um, so let's try this and see if we can get the case to trigger uh, just, you know, hard coded there. All right. So here's me running to that location. Uh, and here's me going into push size. Uh, it's gonna do clear to zero in alignment of four, which seems like a reasonable test case. Uh, so here we come through this code. Uh, there is no current block, so it means we enter here. Uh, and it means that we're going to allocate uh, a block size of 1024 times 1024. Uh, and off we go. Uh, we're going to only use uh, slightly less than that. So if you look at what's going to happen here, right, um, we've got a block size that's that's that big. Uh, we're using, I believe, 1024, 10, well, actually, I guess I can just look at it here, right? Um, and so the actual amount left is gonna be that 30 bytes that we wanted. Okay, um, so there's us allocating it uh, and here's us clearing it and now we've returned it to the user, right? So they've got that. Now we're gonna try to do a push size on test B and this is where the bug is supposed to trigger, right? So we come into the code and we've got a size in it here of 50 uh, and we're going to uh, now try to allocate that we do have a current block, and so we're gonna get an effective size back. And you can see that the effective size actually did come back as something else, which means it is gonna to have to be aligned, right? Which seems reasonable. So now we do our test. Uh, we say, look, do we need to go in here? And of course we do, because it's going to not work, right? Um, it's not, it's gonna overflow. So of course, we still have one test we're gonna to have to check, which is when this is right on the boundary, because that's also the one that's being uh, suggested as case, so we'll do that in a second. Um, but here we go, uh, we allocate a new block, and we put this in the block, and we clear it, and we're happy, right? And everything's good. Okay, so now let's try one that's right on the boundary, right? So, we know we have 30 bytes left, right? Um, and so if I were to put 31 bytes in, that's the minimum I could ask for that would overflow. If I asked for 30, it would fit, right? But if I ask for 31, it won't. And the argument here is that I can ask for 31 and it will still say that it fits and fail. That's what the bug report is claiming uh, off by one error, right? Um, so this should find that case if that was happening because we know we got exactly the block size here minus 30 and then we're going to try and put 31 into it. 
Um, although now that I think about it, the alignment's gonna be wrong here. Let me try that one more time. Uh, we would need it to not change its size when aligned. So we probably will have to change the alignment here to be one byte alignment because otherwise this will expand to be 32 at least. Um, well, you know what, here, how's that? Um, well, no, because it would need to be 33. This will fit and will work, right? Um, without changing the alignment, I can't do one byte over. Uh, it's right. Uh, I mean, well, uh, well, no, I guess I could, because if it's only aligning the bottom, it won't align the top. So that's actually fine. That's fine. That should uh, produce exactly the case that, that you wanted, right? Okay. Um, so we come down here to the arena. We say, all right, let's allocate something with 32 bytes left, which we're going to do here. Uh, and then let's go in and see what happens when we try to allocate 33 bytes, which is one more byte than we would be able to actually fit into this buffer, right? Uh, so we come through and we're hoping our size stayed 33. It did. Okay. So now trying to, again, look at the bug that is claimed. Uh, so if we look in here, oops. Um, so if we look at how much is in the current block uh, used, right? Uh, and we look to see that block size is this. So if I actually go and, and subtract this from it, right? Uh, you see that we can fit 32 bytes in here and we're asking it to fit 33. So this is the closest case I can possibly construct for the bug that you're talking about, right? So now what you're saying is we won't go into this routine, but of course we did go into the routine and precisely for the reason I said, which is that this has to be higher than this uh, in order to fail and it is, right? Why is that the case? Well, the arena current block size uh, is this, which is 1024 times 1024, and the arena current block used plus the size we're asking for is one over that, right? Um, which is exactly uh, what it should have done. So, uh, not sure how else to demonstrate the fact that the code doesn't have that bug that you're talking about. Um, uh, anyone want to tell me why this bug's still open? Uh, try allocating four 1024, 1024 bytes. Okay. When do you want that just as the first allocation or the second allocation? Just out of curiosity. Um, I mean, I guess I can try it as either, right? So here's what would happen if we do, uh, if we try to allocate four megabytes as the second allocation. Um, so we go ahead and do, uh, where's my, there it is, okay. Uh, so here's us doing that. Um, so in here, we would want to uh, just do the same. We already know what happens when we do that. And so here we've got a size B, which is this. Um, and I'm not sure why this is a relevant test case necessarily, but uh, you can see it adjusts the size if it needs to here. Um, and then it, you know, um, allocates that block. exactly as you would expect. So nothing weird there. Um, as the first allocation. Okay, so what you wanna do is, I assume retain this. Do you want that? 
or that. Um, and I'm not sure which one you want, so I'll just do this one first, right? <clears throat> um, so yeah, uh, if we go ahead and allocate that first, uh, we kind of know what's going to happen here because there's no block. So we're just going to allocate that much, right? Uh, it's very predictable. Um, you know, nothing, <clears throat> nothing much goes on. Uh, so then in here where we get size B, uh, we're going to allocate the 33, but uh, that's the, the block is presumably completely used, right? Um, so it, it would go into there no matter what you allocated. Like as long as it wasn't zero bytes, you're done. Um, so like totally I am looking at the chat, by the way, but no one's no one's saying anything in the chat that's useful, are they? <laughs> Here's the same test, but with the 32. So like, I guess what I'll say about this is, I mean, that is, I don't know what else I could possibly test there. Um, the, you know, like, the right way to phrase this, I think, would be, this seems like a premature bug report. Like if you actually had a repro case for it, you should send the repro case um, so that we can actually do it because this definitely doesn't repro, right? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it's okay to put bugs in that's just like, I think there might be a bug here, but this was like kind of an oddly specific bug report. It's suggesting, like, you know, if you're going to put that into a bug report <laughs> um, or that, uh, you should have actually isolated the bug, right? Uh, but that's not what happened here. This is, this is not a bug. Um, and there may be a bug in the code somewhere, but this ain't it, right? There isn't an off by one error on that line, at least not the kind that's being uh, talked about. So, uh, again, you know, <clears throat> I would say this kind of... Um, is sort of a general thing that I would say uh, two things about it. First of all, hopefully that was useful just to see how you would go through something like that to, to verify whether you've got a bug of the kind suggested or not. The other thing is, uh, if you want to uh, submit bug reports to something, it's usually a good idea to make sure that you're actually submitting something concrete that you know about, right? Um, because especially with something like this, it's like, well, you know, it takes a bunch of time for the person on the other end to verify that your bug does or doesn't exist. Since you're already there to do that, you should actually do it, right? Um, and uh, try to get the thing in there, right? But uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, why is this still open? I guess would be my, my larger question. So this should just get closed, right? Um, I mean, I guess I'll close it myself. Uh, so yeah, but hey, you know, it can't hurt to double check with the, uh, that the allocator's working. Um, as planned as well. And, you know, uh, one thing that I would generally do on a project a little later on, not right now, um, uh, is I would probably unit test my allocators, you know, uh, and a couple other, like there's a few small things inside a game typically that are like, 
fairly system e things that can be unit tested. Um, and oftentimes I will do that. So something like the allocator where you, you, you know, we didn't have an off by one error there, but you know, you could see having such an off by one error. Uh, and the interesting thing about having an off by one error is uh, that, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that a, a carefully targeted unit test can find. And so one thing that I will often do is for something like an allocator, you know, um, I'll put things in there that in intentionally probe those boundaries, much like the code I just wrote um, to check for that bug and then just run that, right? Uh, so, you know, like, uh, even though we stress the allocator quite significantly in Handmade Hero right now by calling it all the time to allocate everything, all that really tells you is that in the mine run of allocations, you don't have any bugs, right? But what it doesn't tell you is in that like 0.01% of cases, maybe you're just never hitting them, right? Because you never happen to allocate anything quite that small or quite that unaligned or quite that something, right? Uh, and so I think that's, probably uh, I think that's probably a, a good argument right for a place to put some unit testing in because it's not hard to unit test it's an isolated system with well-defined inputs and outputs so that's a pretty good place to put that testing and it would look a lot like an expanded version of what we just did try to pick a lot of allocations that will force it to do things right on the edge of what it's defined to do to make sure that there aren't places where it gets one wrong, oops, it like thought it didn't need to allocate, but it did, or thought it did need to allocate, but it didn't. And then we'd check a few more things, right? Um, where you would kind of go uh, from there. Now, the reason I haven't, so, you know, I get asked about unit tests a lot. And uh, so you might ask, well, if I'm saying that I might write a unit test for something like that, why not write it earlier? Uh, and there's actually a really good reason for that too. Uh, the reason for that is unit testing wastes a lot of time and effort, right? Um, and so if your unit testing doesn't find any bugs, it was a complete waste of time, actually, right? Um, and that's kind of an important thing to internalize. A lot of people don't think about how much time things take and whether those, that time could be better spent elsewhere. So what that means is any time you spent make writing unit tests is time that you flush down the toilet. That's a given. If it finds bugs that would have taken a long time to find or that would have slipped into the project uh, and caused catastrophic failures on end user machines, it was well worth it. If it doesn't, it wasn't worth anything, right? And that's just the truth. There's no real way to get around that hard fact. What that means is even if you are going to do unit testing because you have specific systems you want to make sure uh, are more bulletproof because uh, you think there might be bugs in there and you are afraid that they will get released with those bugs, you don't necessarily just write unit tests. You still have to pick when you write them. And there's two things about that. Number one, you want to wait as long as possible to write the unit tests because since code tends to evolve and change, if you write the unit test too early, you'll end up testing something that you then change and have to rewrite the unit test for. Very important. So you want to wait as long as possible. And two, you want to make sure that you use the information you have available to guide your unit tests. If you have systems that start showing bugs that are hard to find, that's a great place to say, maybe this is somewhere I can use some unit testing because now you have evidence that there are subtle bugs occurring. And rather than spend the time to debug them raw, maybe unit test can help you, right? And so if we had had some subtle bugs with the allocator already, I might have said at that point, let's start doing some testing because by doing that testing, we will make it easier to get the bugs out because we'll have concrete, things we can step through. It's like, oh, we don't have to run the game and wait for it to crash. We can like actually get it to crash like right away. And that's really important, right? But also then I'm like, okay, 
I'm, I'm sort of getting dual duty out of that debugging. In addition to being able to debug the bug I have, which is a known problem, so I know I'm not wasting my time because I'm going to have to find it one way or the other, I can also dual leverage that time to basically uh, make a unit test I could maybe run again in the future to verify I haven't broken anything, right? So again, uh, stay away from dogmatic approaches to things like unit testing and think more carefully about what is giving you the most payback for your time. Um, and that is a great way to ensure that you won't spend a lot of time writing unit tests on things that actually never end up shipping because they get deleted or rewritten. Uh, or that you don't end up time spending time running unit tests on things that didn't need to be unit tested in the first place. Blah, 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 right? Um, so I guess that's what I would say. Uh, and you really need to understand that. Much like anything else, there's, uh, you know, there's very few programming things. There's a couple probably, but there's very few programming things that aren't useful sometimes. Um, and unit tests are just like everything else. They're useful sometimes. So the important thing to remember is you have to understand what they do. You have to understand why you are doing them and what the benefits are so that you can make intelligent choices about when they are employed. And that statement is pretty much true about everything in programming. Uh, and so you kind of want to make sure uh, that you understand cognitively what's going on there. And hopefully that captures it all up. Last thing I'll say is it sounded like the bug report for the arena allocator there was actually a bug report from somebody trying to compile it in a language that isn't C++. At that point, I would say just don't send bug reports if you didn't bother to reproduce them in C++, right? Um, like if you haven't actually taken the time to actually verify that the language that we build in has the bug, then you really shouldn't be submitting a bug report, right? Um, because you have no idea it might be something with that language or that language's precedence rules or that language's who knows what um, that's causing the bug. So it's really inappropriate to submit a bug report um, unless you've verified the bug in the language that you're reporting the bug in, right? Um, so I would say that's probably a bare minimum. Um, if you do want to still report a bug, you're welcome to do so, but maybe mark at the top for me. This bug was never tested in C++, so I can just move it to the end of the list and never look at it. Um, until the very end of the project, right? Because otherwise it wastes a bunch of time like it did today, not really getting anything done. And it's like, okay, had I known that that bug was never actually reproduced in the handmade hero code base, I wouldn't have bothered looking at it, right? Um, not for a long time anyway. Okay. Um, so I think we're good to go uh, now with those bugs. Uh, that one got closed out. I don't know why I, uh, I should have gone back to here though. Um, so I don't think there's anything else we really want to look at right away. Um, this one is a problem on Max, I think, that people were having. Uh, so we do want to look at this one eventually. Uh, it's probably something we want to fix in general um, to do with the way that we're allocating frame buffers potentially. So uh, we do want to get that eventually. Uh, probably these two both want to um, deal with that, uh, I'm guessing. Uh, also, you know, Martin's reported a, a thing here that we should definitely fix. It's, it's a dumb thing we're doing. Um, so there are some things here uh, that, that probably want to get uh, fixed. This one probably won't get fixed, but that's uh, sort of a separate issue. Um, all right, so now we're down to trying to uh, actually work with the asset system here. Uh, and what we want to do is go ahead and uh, just work with it a little. Look for bugs, right? Uh, because we probably got some. And we want to make sure that those bugs are uh, are tracked down and killed early, so we're not like dealing with a bunch of stuff. Um, you can see that right now we haven't really done anything in terms of like uh, saving out the hero's alignment points uh, to the for the most part. Um, so we've got like a bunch of work to do here, uh, and then we have to also put in alignment points for everybody else. Now it turns out our art assets were wrong for the hero, so that's something that has to be repaired, uh, and we'll repair that a little later. So the head facing direction is is backwards. Oh well. Uh, so we'll fix that in the art assets a little later, and and uh, and make that change as well. Uh, but everything else, <clears throat> we should be able to uh, work with a little bit more. Uh, so let's take a look at what's going on here. Let's suppose I open up uh, the editor here. 
And I just want to start playing around this a little and see, you know, if it works at all, basically. Um, and so if you take a look at, at the uh, alignment points here, um, just, just looking through, uh, yeah, this looks all like what I would expect. Um, just looking through the alignment points here, right, uh, you can see that we've kind of got uh, one here for the, um, uh, for the body uh, and then one for attaching the head. Uh, and what I was kind of saying before, right, you can see the way this works. Um, I would like a little bit more ability to sort of turn these on and off. Right now what I have to do, like let's say we, I wanted to set up this default alignment for the body. Uh, you can see that I can like edit it here just fine, but it's really hard to see whether I'm putting it in the right place or not because the head's in the way. Now I can go switch this to something else temporarily uh, and then place all the markers that I think should be placed and where they should be placed, right? Like, I don't know uh, exactly where this should be, but it's something like that probably, right? And then switch this back, but you can kind of see how that's pretty janky. Don't really like it. Uh, and so I feel like I need to have, maybe, maybe I want this uh, thing that I'm doing here if you turn off an alignment point, maybe it stops functioning entirely um, so that we can just turn it off temporarily, adjust the thing, and then turn it back on, right? Um, that seems a little better to me, and so I might go make that change. The other change that I think we need to make um, is now seems like the right time to go into the renderer and put our Z-Bias uh, stuff back in. Because as you can see, when we actually put sprites on here, they will in interpenetrate the ground. And the reason for that is we're aligning the tile that we're, well, I shouldn't say tile, billboard's a more correct term for it. Uh, we're aligning that billboard <clears throat> such that we, uh, uh, we need it to, to put the highlight point at a specific lineup spot in three dimensions but in order to do that it may be placed such that the ground right is it says that it sinks through the ground so what we want to do is create the correct bias information in z to uh, or, or the correct placement of the quad i mean whatever we want to do right we need to make sure that we're doing that correctly and we put that off until now because we wanted to have our actual assets uh, correct first but you can see that that's a problem right and there's two problems there the first one is that interpenetration problem and we'd like to get that fixed uh, the other one is uh, kind of a related problem which is that if i hop in a doorway uh, you can see that i clip through the doorway as well so figuring out how to get that z um in there correctly that's something we really want to get get right. Uh, and one of the things about that that occurs to me is I think that I've kind of been approaching that problem wrong sort of this entire time to a certain extent, right? Um, because I think it's actually something that we can sort of solve correctly. Uh, if we really work out the math precisely, right? And the reason I say that is because I think 99% of the time, right, what I want to have happen is I want to have the placement of the sprite essentially be a card in 3D Z-wise such that no matter where I put this head, the z value for the base of the sprite will be the z value where the base of the position was and then the top of the sprite will be the z value that is wherever it should have been for its height right and that's what i want to have happen so we should be able to solve for that and i think i said we were going to do something like that like let's do something like that um so i kind of knew that was coming down the pipe but we haven't explicitly formulated it and we should. And that will, I think, get us to the point where we can finally see like a robust, uh, completely 3D integrated 2D and 3D thing, 
which is pretty hard to come by. Not many games manage to do it um, to the level that we want it done here. Uh, and we've done a lot of things that get it pretty close, but that's the one we haven't quite finished yet. And I think we should try to do that now. Because instead of, we don't want to start uh, working with our art assets and bake uh, things into them that are wrong because we didn't do uh, this part of the process. All right, so I think we should do that today. My only question is, do we have enough time to do it? Looking at the time, I think we have about 40 minutes. So I think that's at least um, a good time uh, to, to maybe get started on it, right? All right. Um, so let's take a look at how uh, we want this to work. So if we go into, um, uh, if we go into Handmade, uh, the, the renderer, right? Uh, and we look at the Z bias shader, which, oops, uh, which apparently is actually in here, okay. Um, I wanna look at the Z bias shader. This is the OpenGL part, uh, so I actually want here, right, yeah. Uh, and so if we take a look at the Z bias, I guess I can just jump to it like this, don't know why I'm, I'm just doing that. Uh, if we look at the Z bias shader, uh, what you can see here is there's this modified Z thing, uh, and it's basically saying, look, uh, whatever the in vertex, you know, is, uh, we got to do some, some nonsense here and produce a, a new Z, right? Uh, and so what we're going to do is produce a Z vertex uh, that has this bias baked into it. So the Z value that we're actually passing uh, gets changed, right? Now, the problem with that is that I'm not sure that's going to actually be as expressive as we want it to be. Right, um, it might be, but it might actually just be a pain in the butt because really all we're trying to do here is specify uh, a transform on these points that puts them such that their effective Z values fall within specific range for the Z buffer, right? Uh, and so, I just don't know. I just don't know if that wants to be encoded the way that it's being coded here, right? That's that's the the touchy part. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the blackboard and try to explain what I'm thinking out loud, uh, and hopefully that will give you some perspective on exactly uh, why we. Here we go. Uh, on exactly why we need to uh, consider the encoding. Wait, why does it say day 518? It's supposed to say day 519, right? I mean, I wrote it right there. I don't know, I, maybe I hit a hotkey by accident. I don't know what I did. Sorry about that. It's day 519, right, right folks? I mean, it just is. I don't know why that said that. Sorry about that. Hope that doesn't confuse anyone uh, later on. Uh, anyway, so day 519. So what I was trying to say here is, look, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have uh, some ground point here. And we're going to be putting a sprite card in here, but that sprite card is going to be set up in a way that really doesn't necessarily correspond to what we want its Z values to be. Why? Because what we want to do is take essentially a slot, right? This is basically like a, a little plate, a virtual plate. And what we want to do is say this Z set, right? So the Z range from here to here, right? This would be the maximum value. Well, I shouldn't say maximum value because that's a little ambiguous when you talk about Z because it depends on how you want to do your Z buffer and all that stuff. So let's say this is the closest to the camera and this is the furthest from the camera, right? So if you take a look at what's happening here, 
no matter what we end up aligning our sprite to be, because we may end up having our sprite, you know, look like that or something, right? <clears throat> its lowest point, we still want to be sorted as if it was here, because that's just how we're saying the sorting works. You get placed as if you're at this point in space, tough, right? So we want the Z value to be that for here, right? Um, and more specifically, the way you might think about it is we want this point to behave uh, as if it were sorted into this location, Z-wise, right? And then furthermore, we want this point to behave as if it were sorted into this location, Z-wise. And the fact that they're not even remotely there doesn't actually matter to us because what we're trying to do is falsely present this sprite as if it was in that location, right? I mean, that's what we're fundamentally trying to do. So, um, the problem that we have is we like to express that directly, but obviously each one of these quads kind of needs some way to encode this and we don't really want to spend a ton of space encoding it because the more space we spend encoding it uh, the more expensive it's going to be right so when we actually send down triangles we know um, that we're going to be interpolating those values when we actually send down triangles we're just gonna have vertices that have x y z w um, on them and that's all we get we could, <clears throat> if we wanted to make our pipeline more outrageous, certainly do something more complicated than this. We could have a shader that uh, actually takes some kind of other per primitive thing, like here's the plane I want to use for sorting, and then it could output that as additional uh, things to the pixel shader as necessary and all these other sorts of things, right? So we certainly could get more complicated than this, but I want to try and keep it simpler if possible, because every step we take in that direction, again, makes it more and more unlikely that you can port this thing to various platforms. Uh, it makes it require harder and harder core hardware. And so we kind of want to manage what we're mandating. Um, because, you know, if you wanted to turn off stuff, <clears throat> Uh, like our depth peeling, you could just do so and get worse anti-aliasing, right, or something. Uh, you, you know, be sparklier or something. But you could still run it, right? Whereas if we do some really crazy stuff uh, that makes it very hard to do it uh, without a fancy uh, graphics card, you, scaling it down in the future might be very difficult. And again, it's an educational project not a game designed to just push the limits and who cares if anyone understands how it works and who cares if you can run it on a Raspberry Pi someday and who cares and who cares and who cares, right? So again, we want to sort of say, look, let's just have some consideration for what might go on there and see if we can do something with just that W parameter. You know, can we just make sure or, or can we try to make that be enough, right? Okay. So if we look at how the Z bias is actually working, then what's going on here is we're taking the actual transform of the object. Um, and really all we're doing is saying, well, we're going to take the, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we're going to go ahead and fake the Z buffer by doing two transforms. The first transform is gonna be the actual vertices that we've got. The second transform is going to be the vertices that we had, but with uh, a value added to their Z. So they're going to be artificially moved closer or further away if you want to. They're going to artificially be moved closer to the camera. And then we're going to take that modified Z and that's the Z that we're actually going to, uh, that we're actually going to, um, pass down to the renderer for Z buffering, right? So when it actually does the depth buffer check, it's gonna use that modified version uh, instead of, of the version that's uh, actually representative of where the pixels are. Oh, <clears throat> 
Uh, and so this gives us an easy way to change what the z-value should be of a surface, but it also uh, does make it a little bit uh, trickier for us to figure out how we would create the circumstance that we actually wanted to create. It's especially weird uh, because of the fact that if you think about how the game is currently presenting the information that it's trying to present, we are actually adjusting, in a sense, the location in in y almost of of the uh, of the sprite right now it may be a little bit confusing what i'm saying when i'm saying that what i mean to say is if this is the floor tile again that we're looking at uh right so you know here's a wall or something <clears throat> if i'm trying to place someone in the center of the tile then the problem that we have is you know the artwork is drawn uh to sort of have some volume to it right uh, so if this is, uh, you know, the hero, uh, then this position here, the art actually, you know, sort of circum, uh, like, like creates sort of a, a circular region around there, right? So that if you look at where this would be, if it was actually a 3D object, meaning instead of having uh, hand-drawn art, we had 3D, you know, uh, assets that actually got rendered, well, the position of this bottommost part that we're rendering here, so this part right here, right, actually isn't displaced in Z in the world. It's displaced in Y, right? Um, it's moved in Y this direction so that it transforms to there instead of here, right? Um, <clears throat> and that's why it doesn't, clip when it is actually moved out is because it's actually also moved closer instead of just you know being moved uh, down which is what's happening now <clears throat> uh, and so you know that is the operation we would actually be trying to mimic is that moving it out in y and then producing whatever that z value uh, would be now i guess there's a small part of me that asks the question, should we just be displacing the things in Y to get their Z and then that's what we do? And I don't really know the answer to that question. But I guess what I would say is I think it's not exactly clear that that's what you want because if you actually do that, you are moving the actual physical location of the thing, which would change a lot of other behaviors that wouldn't work. So I think you still need to draw it there and you just need to come up with the Z bias value that is the Z that you would have used had you displaced it to that location, <clears throat> right? Uh, and so again, I'm not sure exactly what that value wants to be. And I'm, as a result, not quite sure how we would encode it. So if you think about some ways we would have encoded it if you just went pie in the sky. If you imagine looking at this thing from the front, so let's suppose we're just looking at it like this. Um, so, you know, this is the ground. Uh, this is the wall. Right? And so if we look at this here, you know, let's say we're standing on that, right? Uh, and so... I would normally draw a sprite card that just looked like this, but of course what we actually end up doing is we draw a sprite card that looks more like this, right? Um, we displace it so that it's on an angle, so that it looks more facing to the camera than it really should be. Um, and then we also drop it down a little bit, right? So that it appears a little bit closer. And maybe that's a little bit pronounced compared to where it would be, right? Um, but suffice to say, the z-bias necessary to make this not interpenetrate the ground um, is precisely the z-bias that's given by this interpenetration depth. 
Now, it just so happens that it's pretty handy uh, how this would get computed. It's not a hard thing to compute. Uh, really, what you would do is you'd just say, well, if I wanted to know the z-bias of this transformation, I could just recognize the fact that this is a right triangle. I know how far I just placed it down from here because that's exactly the alignment points y offset from the bottom of the sprite. So that's pretty straightforward, right? This is just that y offset uh, here, right? Um, and so if I want to, I just need to, to be able to figure out, right, if this is the sine um, of theta here, which it is, uh, then this is the cosine of theta here, right, proportionally. Uh, so y offset cosine theta, um, well, actually, that's not quite true, sorry. Um, in order to figure out what the hypotenuse here actually is, I need to do this around the horn, right? So this leg right here, I know that h sine theta um, is going to be the y offset, right? Uh, and I'll just call that y for now. Uh, so if I then want to know what the hypotenuse is, well, okay, that's pretty easy. I just divide by the sine, right, of the angle. And then I want to know this value here, right? So I want to know what the cosine um, angle times it is, right? So I want to know what uh, you know what x is basically, and I know that x equals h cosine theta, right? Um, so if I want to know what x is, x equals h cosine theta, right? In this case, uh, and I know that h is y over sine theta. I can just plug that in here and say x equals y cosine theta over sine theta, uh, which, hey, is just y tan theta, right? So once I know what angle I am choosing to drop these guys by, because remember this angle right here, right, uh, that we're using here, that's it's effectively the angle of tilt, right? It's the same in either case. Um, so whatever angle of tilt I want to give them, uh, this would give me, if I know the tangent of that angle, then I know uh, what this z bias value would be, right? I know how far it has to get displaced um, in z in order to be correct, right? Um, so I know that value. The problem is, again, that's really uh, not even how we're computing the z-bias right now. The way we're computing the z-value is z-bias is an actual movement in z. The actual movement in z means how far do you move this point up to get it to the correct uh, z-value, right, after transform. Um, and that part is a little more confusing to me and not 100% clear uh, on what that would be. Because in order to get a z-value that's the same as this one, right, uh, you're assuming that there's some, that there's the plane of the camera, right, which is passing through here. And so in order to put this point on the same plane of the camera, and, and to be fair, these planes look, they don't look like that, right? They look more like this, right? And so what we're saying is, well, we want this point to be on the same plane of the camera as like this point is, or somewhere around there, right? Um, <clears throat> and so what we wanna do is say, well, that plane of the camera, that one here, we need to move this up to that point. But like that point is really not obvious to me how you encode any convenient way. So like using either the angle of tilt, which I guess you wouldn't necessarily know, so the angle of tilt's probably bad, but maybe the angle of the camera, um, which maybe you could do a computation a little easier, would be an easier thing to compute. But again, you can see why it's pretty tough to figure out what you would put into the Z uh, there to make that work. Um, <clears throat> And I really don't know. Uh, 
I guess one way of thinking about now nope, that requires another vector. Uh, I'm not having a brainstorm here. I'm not having the flash of, of brilliance. It's how you encode this in for each vertex into just one parameter. Uh, like I said, pretty obvious to me how you would do it uh, if you could just encode points and say this is the, transform this, this entire other point, right? Like forget it. Like you know, don't transform this point. I'm giving you transform this completely other point that has nothing to do with it. Um, that makes some sense because then you would just say, all right. This is the place I want this vertex to appear like it is. It's actually over here, but I don't care. So just transform this one and produce that Z value and then use that, right? Yeah, then I'm not. I'm not coming up with anything. And another thing that, mm hmm. Another thing that kind of creates a problem here is that the location that you transform to <clears throat> uh, in pixel space is also wrong you know what I mean uh, you know the ideal way to do it would be to say something like I'm gonna tell you where in the depth buffer you should be looking in addition so like you almost want to like draw a quad and say rasterize this quad and do the depth buffer testing on it and then write the pixel <laughs> um, write the pixel if you find that you could have right um, and again not not a particularly plausible thing to do you could obviously make a fairly uh, inventive render that worked that way but I don't know. So I'm, I'm, kind of, uh, I'm kind of at a loss to know exactly how I would encode this so that you're gonna get a Z bias that's, that's really stable. Uh, and you've seen on Animate Hero the difference between getting something really right and not quite getting it right. So like for example, when we redid our camera code to like do tight, uh, computation of like the fading bounds and like good interpolation um, it just felt so much better you know and there weren't weird artifacts where the fading was off sometimes it just feels so much more solid and so I feel like this is one of the last parts of the sprite compositing 2d 3d hybrid thing that's that's really nasty um, <clears throat> But I feel like we can get it exactly right, or at least get it that solid thing that's just like, yeah, this is how you do it to have it really compute well. But I'm just not thinking of the magic answer. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I got this out the other day because uh, I had noticed it was around and I, and, I, and I put it on the owl, the owl's over there. Uh, and I was thinking maybe when we really need to get down to business, here we go, right? Get our little tennis, tennis headband on. I don't play tennis by the way, but I associate these kinds of headbands with people who play tennis. So we just put our tennis headband on. Uh, and I think the important thing to remember about headbands is that they help keep your thoughts in, right? They're, they're like keeping, they secure the thought, right? You know what I'm saying? They just any of the thoughts that we're going to kind of get out through this ring right here, um, those thoughts ha are being reflected back in, giving you the power of both your thoughts right now and your thoughts from a few seconds ago, 
And that, you know, that's where it's at. So putting our headband on and trying to think harder about this, right? Um, let's try to write some more direct correspondences here and see if we can, something starts to jump out at us, right? So when we take a look uh, at what we're trying to do here, we have this part of the wall, right? Oops. Right, here's the wall. Here's the floor. Uh, we're, we would get exactly the results we wanted if we just drew the sprites like this, right? And we can do that if you go look at how, like we actually have code, right? Um, where we do our sprite transforms, uh, I think it's in here. I think we do it in here. I don't know if we actually did. Don't, don't quote me on that. Um, Maybe we do it in here, maybe we don't. Let me look at the element code, uh, sorry, entity code, uh, and see if, if we do or if we don't, because uh, I, don't, I don't really know if we do. Um, so in here, you can see us doing our push. Uh, yeah, so we're calling sprite values for upright, uh, and then we call push sprite. So you can see uh, push sprite somewhere. Here it is. Um, you can see push sprite on here. Uh, doing its thing, right? Uh, and you can see when we create these, uh, we're just not putting in any Z bias at all, right? So that's why we're clipping through the floor. We don't have any Z bias in there at all. Um, and when we're creating these, so you can see sprite values for upright, right? Sprite values for upright. Uh, when we're creating those, the T camera up var variable <coughs> Uh, is really what determines how bent uh, the thing is, right? Uh, and so if in here I say, okay, the T camera up, and, and I can, I think we can uh, just look at this in, in practice, right? Uh, so if I say, look, we're going to use that, uh, that T camera up value, uh, then we don't need to worry about Z bias as much. Well, I, you know, that's even that's not true. Now I think about it. That's only true at the top. Right, so that's only uh, true uh, for like the sort the sorting that happens like here, right, against the wall. Um, so I take that back. That's not true. Even if we set that, it's the bottom when we do that alignment. Because of the alignment, the bottom would still interpenetrate through. So it's not true. Changing it wouldn't be the case. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and continue to work that through, uh, and I'll forego what I was saying before because it's actually not accurate. Um, but let's pretend that T camera was directly up, and now let's work through what we would do to correct the alignment in that case, right? Because I think that case we could get correct. So let's suppose the alignment point was actually up here. What's going to happen? Well, we're going to shift down to bring the alignment point into, shocking that, alignment with the position of the entity on the ground. That will shift this card down like this, right? Yielding to this much interpenetration, right? So right there is where we would clip out. If we wanted to fix this, if T camera up, uh, again, was not used, uh, so really T camera up would be zero, I think. So it was just straight Z, right? We were just using straight Z up and down. Uh, so if T cam was, uh, that's the worst handwriting. Wow, it's just been bad today, huh? If T uh, camera up, right? Uh, if T camera up equaled zero, meaning we're not using the up vector of the camera, which will lie things down, because the camera is looking uh, a little bit rotated, right? So that'll lie things down more uh, than they would be if we were looking straight top down. Um, so if we're using that bend, uh, then what we're gonna find is as we use that T camera up, this would get wrong. But if we had this at zero, then we would literally just be using the Z axis for the sprite. So Z bias, if we just set the Z bias to however long this distance is, which we know what it is actually, it's the alignment point um, Y times the height of the sprite, right? Because that's how far we're moving it. 
So we would be able to set the Z bias exactly correct because this is what it would be, right? The Z bias on all four points, in fact, would be set to that. Now, once we get rotation involved, there'd be a little more to it. We'd have to account, we'd have to do the plane multiplication to find out what it was, but then it would be correct, right? Okay. But now we get to a much, much, much worse problem, or at least I think it's much worse, right? Uh, and what happens is now if we let T camera up go to something that is not, right? So not equal to zero, right? Even something small like 0.1, but we're actually more than halfway to T camera up. We're at 0.65 is I think what we set our T camera up to. That's what we thought was a good balance of, of sort of shift uh, as the camera moves. That's going to lie these things down a lot flatter. So what we'll then end up seeing is something that looks more like this. Right? And now you can see what the problem is. If we were to still set the Z bias to the values that it would have been if T camera up were not involved, well then we would be in big trouble because we'd be setting these values to much closer values of Z than they should have been because we're gonna shift them up way more than they need to be. Looking at it again from the side, right? The easy case was the case that we had something that looked like that and we just shifted it down, right? So it looked like that, right? All we did is shift it down. So all we do is like take this point and move it to here, take this point and move it to here. There's actually two points, this is a, you know, it's a quad, but you get the idea, right? We, if we shift it down like this, then the question is, uh, hmm, okay, what do we shift the Z by to make it appear as if it was still right here? Obvious answer, however much we shift it down by in the first place, right? We just apply the negative and that's the Z bias. Pretty simple, should just work, right? But now what do we do when this is what it actually looks like and we've lied it down, right? And now we want to know how will I still see this thing, um, you know, uh, in this case. And it's got to produce a Z value that's the same as this thing's Z value. Well, I don't know what that is unless I project this thing onto this plane, right? Did I just accidentally say the answer to the question? I feel as though I may have accidentally said the answer to the question. If the thing is, I know the plane in Z that this needs to project to, but I don't know where it projects, what if the Z value, I'm sorry, the W value is how we're passing it down. What if the W value I set is just the Z value, the Z height in world space of the plane to which you need to project it, and then you just project it in the vertex shader. So in the case of the bottom vertex, I know exactly what that Z plane is because I know the Z value of this point. 
right? So I know the world Z plane that I would project to. In the case of this, uh, so, so in the case of this, I would just set it to this. It would know this point, and it would find the intersection from here going backwards in the camera direction to that plane, right? And that would be the actual Z value, camera relative Z value, right? If I want to know what the Z value should be for this point, <clears throat> well, I want it to project as if it were well, I don't really know where I want it to project as if it were there. Uh, I guess that's kind of a problem. Where do you want that back point to project to in Z? I mean, maybe you just say that it's some kind of a... Uh, hmm. Well, so I don't really know. But I guess you would say the height value is where that top point should project. So if you want it to project to this Z plane, you would say it would go right there. The problem is you actually want to see it. So you kind of need it to go more like right there. So do I actually know what I'm talking about or not? Well, I might still know what I'm talking about. And the reason I might still know what I'm talking about is because actually this is the point you would pass in, not that one. Because this was the original point, much like this was the original point. So you're passing the Z of this and the Z of this, and this would actually get projected up to this plane. Which might be correct. I'm willing to believe that this is part of the answer Possibly not the entire answer, but it's an interesting start. So basically passing the world space Z I'm willing to give that a try. So passing the world space Z point, which <clears throat> that you want to project to. Um, and what we can do there is just pass the actual Z value anytime we don't want to do this. So you want a bias of zero, because project you're saying project it to the same plane it's already in, right? Uh, I don't know. Does that sound good? I'm going to go ahead and stop there for today and I'm going to say Saturday on uh, Sunday when we resume I might try it. I I can't say for sure that it's right, but I might try that. Uh we'll go to a brief Q&A. Uh and I think that's the best I've got right now. If uh, people have better ideas, they're gonna have to. Uh, they're gonna have to tell me what they are. What kind of testing unit replays do you use on 1935? Have you used over the years? Is automated testing even really a thing at game studios? Um, yeah, actually, um, it, it definitely is used, but it depends on the studio and what value they place on it uh, and so on. What I would say is, uh,
I have written a couple different systems ranging from full recording of everything to just sort of log based stuff uh, that I do use for uh, more for watching playthroughs than for catching bugs usually, but you can also sometimes do bugs with them. Um, I did write walk monster for the witness, but we didn't end up needing it because I later made a system that actually just told you everywhere the player could go um, from a starting point. So you didn't really need that kind of testing. And I really haven't seen much else done at projects I've been on. For unit testing on the 3D animation system I did for Rad Game Tools, that had a complete set of unit tests for all the core functions uh, inside, like, sort of the the runtime library that, it, that it, I made for it. So basically, like, the memory allocator, the math routines, those were tested uh, with unit tests. So, and that makes more sense, too, on a project like that where tons of studios are using it. The more bugs you can find with unit testing, the less... Uh, problems for other people, so that's reasonable, right? Um, so yeah, outside of my personal experience though, I would say that there are definitely uh, studios I know of that at least have used that kind of testing. I specifically remember Chris Butcher telling me that Bungie was a huge fan of doing random walk testing, so they would just basically feed random user inputs into their games. It's just something they would do. And they just feed random inputs over and over and over again. And uh, they said they found stuff with that. I don't know to what extent they're using that these days on like Destiny, um, but it was definitely something that they used to do uh, on at least one of the Halo, like Halo Reach maybe, uh, and, and so on. I don't know what other games, uh, but I know that was a, a specific case. Um, I'm trying to think of, of what other unit tests were usually using games. I don't know. Randomized testing is, is fairly popular um, because, again, games, the hard bugs in games, you can't really, it's, it's pretty hard to design unit tests for them, so you kind of need a different kind of testing. You need something that tries a bunch of stuff and sees what breaks, in a, as opposed to unit testing that tries to isolate things, because usually the units just aren't broken. Uh, usually it's the interaction of units that gets broken, you know? Uh, or gameplay logic stuff that just turns out to put you in an unwinnable state or something that really you know doesn't crash or anything and you can't really detect that's wrong. You just need someone to walk over and go, how did the player end up up on this ledge? That's a totally busted thing. And then you can go look uh, and see if you can find out why, right? But. Can you use on 1935? Not just yet. Gun games. For people who don't want to fuss with platform specific code, would you say SDL is a good solution? Um, I've never used it, so I can't really say that it's a good solution because that implies that I've like assessed it and determined that it was at some kind of a quality level or something, which I definitely haven't done. Um, but what I can say about it is it's shipped in a lot of games, right? So it can't be that bad, right? It's not completely awful because you know that there are games out there running on it right now um, that are running on millions of machines. So it's at least, it, it must do something, right? Uh, it's, about, it's about as good as I can, can, can give. Uh, Without actually spending some time looking at it myself, I couldn't tell you whether it was good or not. Um, but it certainly can't be that bad, right? All right, looks like we're all done. I don't see any other questions. All right, 
Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along with the series at home, you can always go to handmadehero.org and pre-order the game. It comes with all the source code, so you can follow along. Uh, do your own sort of uh, test on the z bias stuff. You got all tomorrow. I'm not here tomorrow. I'm here back here on Sunday. You got all tomorrow to try out your own z bias equations. It's a pretty well isolated thing uh, and pretty easy to experiment with. So, you know, take a look. See if you can figure it out yourself. Uh, see if you can make something that produces nice results for the sprites and sorts them in. Uh, in a way that's pretty consistent with everything 3D that we want to do in the game. It'd be a really good exercise, uh, really uh, useful for people to sort of, uh, you know, see, see what, uh, try out their chops, right? Like, see if, see if you've learned something from all the math we've done. See if you can come up with something. Maybe you just want to try the thing that I said. Maybe you want to try figuring out your own. Um, and, uh, you know, again, would be a really great exercise. Uh, I'll be back here on Sunday. Um, I'm out of, uh, I'm, I'm not around, I'm about to say out of the office, but I guess I just mean I'm not around tomorrow. Uh, and uh, so I will be back on Sunday. Um, until then, uh, again, if you do want to check out any of other uh, Molly Rocket stuff besides Handmade Hero, you can always click on the little Molly Rocket head here, uh, and it will take you to our other stuff. Our comic is out now, which I always try to point people towards since it just got released and hardly anyone knows about it. Um, so if you want a comic to read, you can always go to Meow the Infinite. Uh, you can either go to meowtheinfinite.com or, you know, you can uh, click on it through here. Uh, and if you want to find other stuff, people ask about 1935. Uh, all that stuff, as we get it, it's always up here, right? We've got a blog. Um, you can even go to news. Like any, anywhere on here, there's tons of mailing list sign-up places. You can sign up for our mailing list, all that stuff. We send out stuff as soon as we have something official to announce. So trust me, as soon as I want to show screenshots from 1935, you'll be getting a mailing. It's, I, I won't sneak them out and not tell anyone. I mean, the point of uh, putting games out there is that you hope people buy them so that you survive as a company. We're not going to keep it hidden <laughs> from anybody. Trust me. Um, so anyway, uh, that's it for today. And I will see everyone back here on Sunday. At that point, we'll get to see whether or not Z plane projection is useful or whether it's just a dumb idea. Uh, we had our sweatband on, so I'm hoping that that will increase the chances that it's hardcore. Uh, but you never know. Until then, have fun programming, everyone. And I'll see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.